Ladies and gentlemen, critter and eco enthusiasts, welcome to another thrilling episode of Eric Likes Animals. I am your host, Eric Mahan, and thank you guys for stopping in today. Today we're going to be diving into a wild world of environmental news and of course creatures that make up this amazing place a little bit more special here on planet Earth. Whether you're a first-time listener or you've been around for a while, I'm thrilled to have you along for this exciting journey. So let's get started and buckle up for some environmental news. We've got a Kiwi-licious scoop straight from The Guardian today, because brace yourself for some heart-melting news, because, drumroll please, wild-born Kiwi chicks have made a dazzling comeback in Wellington after a century-long hiatus. This is not just a newsflash, by the way. It's a very sweet milestone for our feathered friends. In an historic moment, two wild-born kiwi chicks have hatched in Wellington after more than a century, following the reintroduction of this national bird to the capital. The kiwi, a vulnerable species in New Zealand, had been absent from Wellington for generations. The successful project known as the Capital Kiwi Project released about 63 kiwi into a vast farmland area in the Makara near Wellington, with more release planned over the next five years. The community's enthusiastic support included placing 4,600 stoat traps, which were installed around 24,000 hectares of land. This has played a crucial role to the project's success. Catching these sleek little non-native predators is of the utmost importance. Conservationists are celebrating this significant milestone in kiwi conservation. Paul Ward, the maestro behind the Capital Kiwi Project, is singing praises, not just because of the trapping network, but for the stellar support crew, including the Makara community and, of course, the landowners who all joined this wildlife conservation success. In a movement that may seem strange, by the way, the two-week-old Kiwi chicks are staying mysteriously without names. Why? Because the Capital Kiwi Project is, of course, in the business of growing a bustling, nameless Kiwi Metropolitan, not organizing a bird naming pageant. Words ecstatic about the very sweet milestone, however, providing that Wellington is the new Kiwi Maternity Ward. However, they still have plenty to deal with. The tough life of a Kiwi chick is like being a fluffy celebrity hounded by paparazzi. But in this case, the paparazzi are stoats and other pesky predators. The kiwi chicks, A-listers of course of the bird world, face numerous threats, with of course stoats leading the charge. Now, adult kiwis can handle themselves as being seasoned bodyguards with their impressive claws, always ready to throw down when a stoat is near, in a sort of feathered kung fu showdown, but unfortunately, they stand no match against cats and dogs, an unexpected party crasher in these birdie brawls, giving even the mighty adult kiwis a run for their money. Only a quarter of the kiwi VIPs are getting the red carpet treatment with monitoring leaving the door wide open for surprise chick appearances. But hey, this project is still in the early days and these chicks are still not done going through their class of Survival 101 Kiwi Edition to celebrate too soon. Ward dreams of turning the Capital Kiwi Project into educational blockbusters, of course, showcasing the Kiwi's resilience and fighting spirit. However, he has to admit they are also pretty darn cute. Next up, in a noteworthy move, Brazil is exploring whether tree farms could play a crucial role in saving the threatened Amazon forest. This strategic approach aims to combat deforestation and preserve the vital ecosystem. It's a serious environmental undertaking that could have significant implications for the future of the Amazon. Stay tuned as we delve into this initiative and its potential impact. This is all, of course, reported by Conservation News. Now, in the heart of Mato Grosso do Sul, Brazil, probably butchered that, I am sorry, a landscape unfolds a vast expanse transformed into a sea of eucalyptus trees, uniform in their four-foot-tall stature. 
These trees, born from decades of careful cloning and management, serve as a vital and sustainable global wood source. However, in this monotone of eucalyptus, nature speaks in silence. No insect chirps or bird sings echo throughout this cloned forest. Across the dusty road, however, lies a very different scene. A dense, vibrant, natural forest alive with the hum of insects and, of course, the chatter of birds. Remarkably, the fate of these two landscapes is interconnected. What once was degraded pasture lands is now undergoing a rapid transformation into not only tree farms, but also restoring over two hectares of natural forest. It's a tale where humans' ingenuity meets the resilience of nature, and the story continues to unfold in the ever-evolving Brazilian terrain. Welcome to the Project Alpha a groundbreaking initiative striving to protect and rejuvenate nature across an area twice the size of Manhattan. Conceived by the PTG, Pactual Timberland Investment Group, TIG, in collaboration with Conservation International. This venture unites the seemingly opposing forces of conservationists and timber operators. Project Alpha challenges preconceived notions about non-native plantations, like eucalyptus found in Australia, emphasizing the need for tested solutions to combat climate change and biodiversity loss. Over the next five years, TIG aims to raise $1 billion from investors to restore nearly 275,000 hectares in Brazil, Uruguay, and Chile capturing 32 million metric tons of carbon, equivalent to removing 470,000 cars from the road. Half of the acquired land will be protected or restored for conservation, while the other half will host commercial plantations. Far from a mere trade-off, the model integrates conservation and commercial activities, offering added value to investors through carbon credit sales and sustainable timber revenue to fund ongoing protection. As Will Turner from Conservation International notes, it's a delicate balance between economic production and environmental protection, a line they hope to walk successfully for positive outcomes in this region. The road to Project Alpha winds through degraded cattle pastures, once part of the vibrant Cerrado a mosaic of diverse ecosystems now under threat. While the Amazon often takes the spotlight, the Cerrado is even more imperiled, losing half of its total size over the years. The mission of Project Alpha is not just ecological restoration. It's a holistic approach in reshaping the future where nature and commerce coexist in harmony. The Cerrado, once a vibrant mosaic of ecosystems, now bears the footprint of an African grass introduced for cattle grazing. This shift, while contributing to Brazil's status as world's top beef producer, has left a staggering mark of about 60 million hectares of this invasive grass pastures, nearly half the size of Peru, all grappling with various degrees of degradation due to years of overgrazing. The scale of the challenge becoming evident in the degraded land. The invasive grass soil poses difficulties for most crops, dissuading investments in returning to the cropland due to its expenses. Restoring the vast expanse back to this original Cerrado state proves even more costly. Contrary to the notion perpetrated by well-intended marketing campaigns that boast forest restoration for as little as $1 per tree, the reality, unfortunately, is more complex. True restoration demands a landscaping-level approach spanning decades, planting suitable trees, engaging with local communities, and ensuring ongoing monitoring for sapling survival. The actual cost can soar into thousands of dollars per hectare challenging the perception of a quick and cheap fix. Restoring nature at the scale required to combat climate change faces a funding gap, which comes in Project Alpha. The Timberland Investment Group plans to restore the largest Cerrado area in history, 
they commit to protect 50% of the project area, leveraging carbon credits for funding. By combining timber production and restoration, they attract significant institutional investments. It's a clever synergy of commerce and conservation, ensuring impactful climate action. Under agreements with investors, the Timberland Investment Group must swiftly invest funds into Project Alpha, driving a pace and scale uncommon in restoration projects. TIG, in a short span, has planted 1.9 million eucalyptus seedlings in the degraded soil where they flourish faster than they do in their native Australia. The meticulous planting process is a precision assembly line strategically depositing identical saplings across the landscape. TIG operates on a lengthy rotation cycle waiting up to 15 years before harvesting the trees. This extended growth period not only produces larger, more versatile logs suitable for furniture, but also enhances carbon storage both while the tree is alive and after harvesting. Project Alpha serves as a transformative experiment aiming to bring back the overlooked Cerrado ecosystem over a 15-year span. The restoration area, once degraded pastures, now witnessed the rapid resurgence of vegetation. The TIG is not only battling a non-native grass, but also implementing extensive monitoring programs ensuring the property's conditions are closely tracked. Conservation International's role involves ensuring TIG's work aligns with conservation science. The project encompasses a holistic approach, including a significant buffer zone along a river, a wildlife corridor, and ongoing discussion about how to combat the invasive grass. TIG is committed to understanding and benefiting local communities, conducting assessments of living conditions, and exploring potential conservation agreements with the nearby Afro-descendant communities. Mark Winchley, Chief Sustainability Officer at TIG, emphasizes the necessity of planting eucalyptus trees to meet the global demand for sustainably grown wood. He acknowledges the skepticism surrounding tree farms, but highlights the urgency to provide alternatives to the illegal wood sources from the Amazon rainforest. The collaboration between Conservation International and TIG offers a model for sustainable business contributing to nature conservation. Winchy concluded by expressing the commitment to make Project Alpha succeed, recognizing that taking this step is crucial to exploring the possibilities of sustainable forestry. And then finally, imagine idyllic Pacific Island embracing a bold vision for ocean conservation. This paradise was unveiled pioneering measures creating vast marine sanctuaries to protect its waters. Join us as we talk about this aquatic tale, where the island's commitment to ocean preservation sets a global example and sparks a ripple effect of positive change. Also reported by Conservation News. So we dive into the Pacific for some exciting news. New Caledonia, a tropical treasure, just pulled off a dazzling move for ocean conservation. They've banned all big players, fishing, mining, and oil drilling in 10% of their waters. It's like giving an ocean a VIP area where whales, sharks, and seabirds, and of course the hottest coral reefs, can party without any industrial interruptions. Thomas Auger, the marine maestro of Conservation International in Caledonia, is all cheers. He says it's not just a win, it's a fiesta for ocean conservation in New Caledonia. Flashback to a decade ago where they birthed the National Park of the Coral Sea, a marine site spanning 1.3 million square kilometers, which rocked a third of the world's largest pristine reefs within it. But guess what? Industries unfortunately had backstage passes and were sneaking into about 98% of this marine VIP area. However, fast forward to October, and bam, New Caledonia cranks up the volume, cranking out laws and turns up protection to keep the VIP area truly protected. Conservation International teamed up with the New Caledonian government, the awesome indigenous Kanak community, scientists, local green warriors, and even the fishing pros to throw an ocean mission like no other. Their mission which they accepted, to identify priority areas and lay down serious protections, especially for the underwater rock stars, the seamounts. 
According to Kanak Belief, Darius underwater mountains are sacred housing for spirits of elders. But hey, it's not just spirits that need these areas. Seamounts are crucial for marine life, playing host to epic whale migrations from the southern ocean to the coral seas. But wait, there is even more. These new marine VIP zones aren't just about New Caledonia. They are part of a grand plan to amp up ocean conservation across the Pacific. Placed strategically next to existing and future reserves, they're creating corridors for marine life to mingle and move freely between countries like Australia, Vanuatu, and the Solomon Islands. It's like creating a global ocean safe zone where fish and friends can find food and love without getting lost in a warming water and human active world. And also, guess what? New Caledonia isn't stopping there. They're actually gearing up to drop a bill that puts a 10-year ban on deep sea mining, the ocean equivalent of a mic drop. This move aims to protect marine life, curb carbon release, and save critical tuna migrations that keep the Pacific Islands booming. Thomas Auger from Conservation International sums it up as, Climate change and human activity mess with our oceans. And we're not just dipping our toes into it. With these protections, New Caledonia is turning into a superhero sanctuary for marine life, showing the world how it's done. And let's face it, with only 8% of the global ocean protected and less than 3% from human activity, we could all use with a bit more ocean superhero action. And that is your environmental news. So welcome to today's Creature Feature where we're going to be diving into the charming world of none other than the raccoon dog. More specifically, the common raccoon dog, a fascinating creature found throughout Asia and introduced to the vibrant landscapes of Europe. Now, you might have also heard about its Japanese cousin, the tanuki, which has loads of folklore associated with them. But today, our spotlight is on the common raccoon dog. In the enchanting realm of raccoon dogs, their versatile habitats are as diverse as their charming personalities. They are found in forests, farmlands, and even the hustle and bustle of some urban areas. These clever creatures thrive near water, choosing scenic beauty of moist meadows, riverbanks, and lakeshores as their preferred stomping ground, drawn to habitats also born with abundant underground creating the perfect coverage for their playful adventures without having unwanted eyes spying upon them. Now, let's talk about their dimensions. The common raccoon dog has a head and body length ranging from about 50 to 65 centimeters or about 20 to 26 inches, giving it a compact but charming stature. Add in its fluffy tail and you're adding in an extra 13 to 18 centimeters or about 5.11 to 7 inches in its total length. As for weight, These mass creatures tip the scales at around 7.5 kilograms, making them more of a lightweight charmer at only 16.5 pounds. In the wild, these enchanting beings gracefully navigate the landscape for a spawn of about 6 to 7 years, where each moment in the wild adventure, some good, some bad, however, in captivity, surrounded by the comforts of 24-7 professional care, these raccoon dogs can extend their journey to a remarkable 11 years. The raccoon dog, of course, is a vision of charm and uniqueness. Picture a small fox-like canid with fur reminiscent of a raccoon. Their heads are small and boast pointed low-profile rostra or kind of pointed face, creating an enduring expression, of course. The fur, dense and soft, weaves a tail of dusky brown to yellow-brown hues that varies across their individual. Now let's explore, of course, the intricate details of their facial features. A white muzzle adorned with black fur encircling their eyes, creating that classic bandit's mask that seems almost stolen from raccoons. Across their shoulders and down their back, they have a striking black marking that forms the shape of a cross. Ears rounded and short, showcasing a charming touch of black hair trimming the white interior. Now, as your gaze may travel downwards, you'll notice that their limbs and chest don shades of blackish brown. Their belly, a lighter brown or tan, completes the ensemble that is the raccoon dog, highlighting the diversity in their color palette. But we can't forget the piece of resist dogs, the thick, bushy tail. 
dorsally black and ventrally light yellow with a black tip. These tails add a touch of flair to the raccoon dog's visual look. Now, the changing seasons also bring about changes in their appearance. In the winter, their fur becomes thicker and darker, creating a cozy coat to withstand the cold. The summer, however, brings about a shed normally between July and October, shedding only some of its fur. Its bigger fur shed seasons are in September and October and November, where during one of those months, the winter fur makes a grand return. But let's not forget their spring shed, which normally begins in April, where their under fur sheds to unveil their summer coat by mid-June. It's a fashion show of nature's design, where each season paints a new chapter in the raccoon's dog visual tale for both camouflage to its surrounding and, of course, to keep them nice and warm or cool, depending on the time of year. Indeed, the raccoon dog's name and appearance may suggest a connection to raccoons, but their true place lies in the canid family. Despite their shared facial markings and many other features, these delightful creatures are more akin to foxes and other small creatures canids than the mischievous bandits often associated with scavenging from your trash cans at night. As for the activity level of the raccoon dog, there is some debate. The mysterious rhythm of the raccoon dog's daily dance. While some studies once painted them as primary nocturnal, recent revelations show a more versatile routine. These charming creatures now showcase regular diurnal or daytime, crepuscular or twilight, and lastly, nocturnal or nighttime activities. So they're basically always awake. Why the change in schedule, you may ask? It seems the raccoon's dog increased activity duration is a quest for sustenance, a search for those delectable bites of food that make up their diet. Nature has turned their internal clocks to a melody that harmonizes with the availability of food each moment of every day. So whether it's the bright light of day, the enhancing hues of twilight, or the quiet canvas of night, raccoon dogs gracefully navigate the hours, adding a touch of mystery to their daily rhythm, letting not the sun, but their bellies really decide when it's time to be awake or when it's time to be asleep. The raccoon dog, by the way, is a culinary explorer in the world of the nature's buffet. It is truly an optimistic omnivore, delighting in a diverse array of Delicate delights. On land, it's a skillful hunter, pursuing insects, small rodents, amphibian, mollusks, snakes, lizards, birds, and of course, the treasure that is an egg. But that's not all. They also have a taste for the aquatic realm, fish in lakes, rivers, and streams. It skillfully uses its paws to scoop prey from the water and even takes a dive beneath the surface in pursuit of any sort of underwater tasty treats. But it doesn't stop there. The raccoon dog's menu doesn't stop on land. It takes a stroll along the seashores, revealing crabs, sea urchins, and occasional sea carrion, aka dead things from the sea, as also part of their menu. And just when you think they have tasted it all, raccoon dogs surprise us with even one more love, which is plant-based treats. Stems, roots, leaves, bulbs, fruits, nuts, berries, and seeds also adorn its menu. Sometimes not even being able to wait for these things to come to the ground, the raccoon dog will actually climb up into trees in search of these tasty delights. The raccoon dog emerges, of course, as an arboreal expert, equipped with curved claws. These crafty canids ascend these trees with finesse, showcasing an accomplished climbing repertoire, another very unique thing that most canids do not have. And it is once again all for the pursuit of a wide variety of food. All these different foods find their way into the raccoon dog's menu, a wide variety of food. All of which are based on the ever-changing season and location of the raccoon dog. Which brings me to the fact that they might actually not be related to garbage bandits at all. But they may have more in common with normal raccoons than we think. For in some of the colder winter climates, raccoon dogs are known to be garbage bandits as well. And yes, like I said, they are still not related to raccoons, I swear. Luckily, they don't have to find all this food alone. In the intricacy of social tapestry of the raccoon dog, scientific studies shed light on their tendency to live and hunt in pairs or small family groups, 
However, for human observers, the most common encounter is with solitary individuals, adding an air of mystery to their social dynamics. The duration of pair bonds formed during reproduction remains a subject of scientific curiosity, with inquiries into whether these connections endure throughout the entire year. During periods of rest or slumber, however, observations indicate that pairs do maintain proximity, suggesting a preference for companionship during these moments. Additionally, social grooming holds significance in raccoon dog behavior, emphasizing the importance of mutual care and interaction within their social structure. In the realm of nature, these creatures navigate a delicate balance between solitude and social connections, contributing to the rich diversity of behaviors exhibited by this intriguing species. And what does an animal that tends to be social need? Of course, communications. As for the raccoon dog's communication style, they forego the traditional dog bark for a high-pitched whine or a whimper a sound that can convey both submissive and friendly sentiments. In the moments of threat, however, a growl can emerge, a vocal cue signaling need caution if approaching. In a departure from canine norms as well, raccoon dogs also abstain from wagging their tail. Also due to poor vision compared to most canids, they opt heavier instead for their reliance on olfactory sensors to navigate their surroundings and sniff out those delicate food sources and help with communication. The reliance on alternative communication methods and heightened olfactory perception definitely helps set the raccoon dog apart from its other canid cousins. Another trait settling it apart from its canid counterparts is they are also known to hibernate. In cozy pairs, they embark on the winter slumber, a seasonal retreat that commences in November and may linger until early April, dictated, of course, by the whims of the local climate. Raccoon dogs exhibit a fascinating ritual before hibernation, potentially gaining up to about 50% of their body weight. However, still even more uniquely, hibernation isn't an absolute necessity for the species. Should an individual fall short in its fat storing endeavor, it might emerge from its den on warm winter days to forage, showcasing the flexibility ingrained in their survival strategies. In the southernmost reaches of its range, raccoon dogs may skip the hibernation spectacular altogether, navigating the winter months with unwavering vitality. Once again, showing that this animal's stomach truly is the thing that seems to decide its, its entire life cycle. Same, buddy. <laughs> but I guess that is until breeding season. Delving into the raccoon dog's puppy love, the intricacies of mating behavior unfold with a veil of mystery, as much remains to be discovered. Scientific studies reveal that raccoon dogs form mating pairs that persist from year to year, showcasing a remarkable tendency toward monogamy with these pairs. During the courtship ballet, females attract the attention of about three to four males. Then a dance, marked by surprisingly minimal conflict among the males, vie for the affection of the female. In captivity, mating is normally seen with heightened scent marking and increased interactions between males and females. In addition, the male's expressive U-shaped tail posture becomes a signal of sexual arousal and dominance during their mating ritual. Females enter heat only once a year post-hibernation. With estra spanning three to five days, copulation typically unfolds in the brisk months of winter, varying from about January to March based on geographic location. The pregnancy spans about 59 to 64 days, accumulating in the birth of pups, normally secluded in dense vegetation or abandoned fox or badger burrows. A raccoon dog family has an average litter size of 5 to 7, although remarkable instances report a peak of 19 pups. Newborns arrive blind, adorned in soft black fur. The unfolding of their world normally occurs as their eyes open around the 9th to 10th day with teeth making appearance by day 14 to 16. Mothers gracefully wean their pups between 30 to 40 days off of milk, unveiling the emergence of the distinct facial markings and fully developed guard hairs. 
Remarkably, offspring reach the size of small adults by about 80 to 85 days, venturing towards sexual maturity at only 9 to 11 months, with both parents helping them along the way. But it's not all snacks for these animals all the time. Raccoon dogs also must navigate a realm fought with potential predators. Amongst the cast of characters seeking to capitalize on these crafty canids for food include that of the gray wolf, the elusive Eurasian lynx, the formidable wolverine, as well as the raccoon dogs have to keep a watchful eye out on the Japanese martens, the majestic golden eagles, the regal sea eagle, and the silent but deadly soaring Eurasian eagle owl. Luckily, even with so many predators, the common raccoon dog finds itself in a relatively stable position on the global stage. According to the assessment done by the IUCN Red List, this crafty canid wears the mantle of least concern along with a population trend of stable. But the plot thickens. For in this tale of the raccoon dog, while its presence may evoke curiosity and charm, the raccoon dog reveals a more complex side as an invasive species. This canid disrupts the delicate dance of ecosystems all around Europe, potentially preying upon native wildlife and serving as a vector for diseases. The harmonious balance in non-native territories finds itself under duress as a raccoon dog weaves a narrative of challenge for the native inhabitants striving to coexist. However, certainly the raccoon's dog journey in its native range is not without its challenges, for they also have the shadows of threat, loom, and the delicate balance in their own natural habitat always on the edge. The primary menace, hunting, casts a long shadow as these creatures are often deemed pests. Additionally, road kills, predation by feral dogs, and the specter of epidemics contribute to the challenges faced by raccoon dogs. Moreover, the in- encroachment of habitat loss adds another layer of vulnerability. The intricate dance of survival for these clever canids in their native realms underscores the ongoing complexity of wildlife conservation. So, what can we do? Implementing thoughtful hunting regulations is indeed crucial to ensuring the sustained health of the raccoon dog populations. Additionally, addressing the issue of roadkill through the creation of wildlife bridges offers a tangible solution, which provides safe passages for the raccoon dogs and, of course, other creatures trying to deal with getting over tricky roads. Moreover, tackling habitat loss involves not only managing urban development, but also addressing the broader global impact, such as the production of disposable chopsticks a major threat to the common and Japanese raccoon dogs in their native range. The staggering number of trees felled annually for this purpose underscores the need for sustainable alternatives like reusable chopsticks. Around 3.8 million trees each year are used solely for the purpose of single-use chopsticks. Using metal and other reusable chopsticks can help save these trees from their once-and-done fate of being a chopstick. Taking such a measure not only aids in the raccoon dog in their native habitat, but contributes to a more harmonious coexistence between humans and wildlife on a global scale, keeping these mass bandits around for years to come. And that's our show. I hope you enjoyed hearing about the common raccoon dog. As always, check me out on Facebook, X, aka Twitter, TikTok, and if you want to email me at ericlikesanimals at gmail.com, links are down in the footer. And of course, once again, thank you for joining me on another wild adventure with Eric Likes Animals. Whether you're a seasoned animal enthusiast or just starting your journey into the fascinating world of creatures big and small, this is your host, Eric Mahan, signing off, reminding you that every creature has a story and sometimes the best stories have fur, feathers, and scales. See you all next time.